Um, well, this year's report reveals that a really persistent fossil fuel addiction continues to drive uh, rapid increases in the climate related risks to health of people, uh, really in every country. And that's by uh, factors such as more intense and frequent extreme weather events or increased heat wave exposure, climate related food insecurity, um, alterations in the spread of infectious diseases such as um, malaria and dengue, and even exacerbated mental ill health as people are exposed to um, climate stresses. So this year's report continues to document those kind of risks to health and importantly that they're very inequitably distributed. So it's often those populations and places that have contributed least to greenhouse gas emissions that experience some of the highest risks to health. How did the study find this out? It brings in about 99 researchers from around the world, from um, academic institutions and UN agencies. And we all have a, a range of different research and skill sets um, from economics to public health, um, to meteorology, to political science. Um, so we will draw on big global data sets to try and understand the associations between changing climate parameters and health indicators. So, for example, a group working on heat-related mortality would look at heat data and then examine how that is associated with heat-related deaths. And what that group has found is that people, particularly vulnerable populations aged 65 years um, or young children, have had really substantial increases in heat-related mortality over the last few decades. Um, other groups will look at the climate suitability for the spread of infectious diseases. Um, myself, I work with a team where we look at um, the impacts of sea level rise uh, for, for the health of people living in very low elevation areas and um, the possibility that some of those populations, if they are unable to adapt, will be forced to relocate away as sea levels rise. And you believe, though, that it is possible to tackle global heating by taking urgent health-centred action. Tell us a bit more about what this would look like. Well, of course, it's grim reading, but there are signs of hope. We have seen um, that total clean energy generation has reached record high levels in the last few years. Um, for the first time, we're seeing direct and indirect employment in renewable energy um, is comparable to employment in the fossil fuel extraction uh, industries. Um, I think there's a global understanding that the health sector, which of course is there to improve the health of populations, is actually contributing about 5% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. So there's quite um, a lot of momentum now for countries to commit to low or net zero carbon health systems. So the UK um, is really forging ahead and now Australia with a new government is starting to make commitments in that area. Um, and I think broadly, there's a very clear understanding that there are incredible health benefits of phasing out fossil fuels. This isn't just about documenting the ways in which climate change threatens our health, but that understanding transitioning to net zero emissions represents an enormous health opportunity. So if we, for example, cut fossil fuel combustion, um, there's the opportunity to prevent more than a million deaths per annum due to dirty air. So there's a lot of reason to move to a clean energy future. And Celia, it was also found that the prevalence of undernourishment increased during the pandemic of COVID-19. What can you tell us here? It's clear that in a warming world, the climatic suitability for growing crops such as rice and wheat um, are reducing so that that climate suitability for crop production is compromised by um, global heating. With COVID-19, we're adding the pressures of um, compounding crises where we have pressures on health systems, on populations, on food security, on cost of living. So really, the risks to climate change and health are occurring in a world with these quite extreme um, compounding crises, which presents an enormous pressure for governments to decide how to allocate resources and how to respond. While COVID-19 exacerbated a lot of these health problems, it also served as a reminder that we can be effective in tackling them if the world mobilises? Yeah, I think that's what's um, so baffling to so many people is that for many years um, there's been a real urgency and demand by researchers, by communities, by um, activists 
to have action on climate change. Um, and yet with the COVID-19 pandemic occurred, we saw there's enormous capacity for this to change the ways we live, to alter forms of mobility, to uh, reduce our um, consumption of fuel. Um, so there was enormous hope that COVID-19 would actually show us we can change, we can um, make substantive and urgent changes um, when we believe it's necessary. And there was also an opportunity for a green economic recovery. So I think perversely during COVID-19, there was almost a sense of hope that this might be the way to reset. But unfortunately, what we've seen is um, greenhouse gas emissions have rebounded um, following the, green, the, the drops um, the COVID-19 related drops in 2020 and demand for coal and oil is now back up again. Just finally, uh, this report was started in 2015 during the Paris Agreement. What progress has there been, as particularly as we approach the 27th UN Climate Change Conference to be held in coming weeks? Well, in 2015, when the report was launched, there was hope that what we'd be documenting as a group of researchers would researchers was gains in public health as we tackled climate change and pulled down greenhouse gas emissions. But of course, what we're continuing to track is persisting threats and fossil fuel addiction. But there's definitely signs of hope. Um, I think uh, with the upcoming COP, um, there's a lot of momentum to generate new um, policy positions and frameworks. Um, for example, the World Health Organization has recently joined with health professionals around the world calling for an urgent fossil fuel non-proliferation non treaty, um, which is actually really interesting. It's positioning oil, coal and gas as substances that harm human health and that need to be um, prevented. So, um, and in Australia, we've got commitments to a national strategy on climate, health and wellbeing. So I think there, there are, there's signs of momentum um, for nationally and globally, um, and hopefully that will translate to action in the upcoming COP. Good to see some optimism there. Celia McMichael, thank you so much. Thanks, Yvonne.